Let's discuss technique for extraction of four impacted wisdom teeth. This is one wisdom tooth case. If you want to see a number of surgical cases, different kinds of surgeries, including wisdom teeth cases, click on the blue link in the description below. Now, as I've said in other surgical dental minute dentistry master classes videos, these surgical videos are not necessarily intended to teach you how to do surgery on dental patients if you've not had hands-on training prior to watching the videos. These videos are intended to enhance your technique if you already know how to use surgery. So my big suggestion is you must have hands-on training to perform surgery. And that's the intent of these videos, to enhance your technique if you already know a lot about surgical techniques. So you can see we've got four impacted wisdom teeth. These wisdom teeth are partially formed. And this is a good time to extract wisdom teeth. You don't want to wait until the root is completely formed because that's a much more difficult extraction. But you also don't want to extract the tooth if it doesn't have any root because it will roll in the socket. So when the root is about a quarter formed, that's the ideal time to extract a wisdom tooth. Administering local anesthetic blocks in the mandible, and you can refer to that link on how to administer painless and profound local anesthesia. Then I'm making an incisional incision on the facial side of the impacted mandibular wisdom tooth and on the lingual side of the second molar tooth. Don't extend that incision very far lingually because you don't want to damage the lingual nerve. So this incision goes to the distal lingual aspect of the second molar. And then you're gonna make an incision on the distal of the second molar. So you can see how the incision incisions meet back here on the distal aspect of the impacted second, third molar from the lingual and the facial. And then this incision on the distal of the second molar. Then I'm using a periosteal elevator and rongiers to remove that piece. And then these are just surgical scissors to cut through this uh, tissue and extend the flap back to about right here. You can see the impacted wisdom tooth. This is a long shank, number six or number four round burr. And I'm cutting primarily into the tooth more than the bone just to create some space into which to move the, the wisdom tooth when I, when I section it. And I'm gonna section the tooth through the occlusal to the furcation and separate the distal uh, part of the tooth from the mesial part with this long shank number four or number six round burr. Now it's very important if you're using a high-speed handpiece that you not reflect the lingual tissue because you don't want to create an air embolism. It's not a horrible thing if you do, but you just don't want to do that. And that's from air getting down into that lingual tissue. So don't reflect the lingual flap. You can reflect the facial flap, but not the lingual flap. Lots of water. You can see how I've cut through here the, the tooth angles this way. So I'm making my cut through the occlusal to the furcation all the way through. And then I've removed some tooth. I'm primarily cutting into the tooth on the distal and the facial more than the bone. So I can elevate that piece into a space. If you don't have a space into which you can elevate that tooth, then it can't go anywhere. So you've got to create that space on the distal and the facial. And then I've sectioned the distal part of the tooth from the mesial. And now I'm using this elevator, an E301, to move that distal part into that space. So remember, if you don't have a space, into which you can move the tooth, you may not be able to elevate it unless you can elevate it straight up. Be sure you're protecting the airway and guarding this with a mirror or a two by two so you don't, so the patient doesn't aspirate the piece of tooth. So here it comes and removing that distal part 
with the rongiers. So here's the mesial part, and I'm drilling a hole into the mesial part with this 703 long shank surgical burr. Now sometimes you can just place an elevator on the mesial and elevate that straight out. But with this, in this case, I'm drilling a hole into the mesial facial aspect of that mesial part of the tooth and I'm elevating it with this Hugh Freedy E8. Just put it in that hole and just elevate it right out of there. That came out nicely. Now I'm removing the follicular sac from the socket and that's very important and you do that with Ron Gears or that could develop into a dentigerous cyst and an ameloblastoma so you want to be sure that you remove that follicular sac. You don't want to cure it with a spoon because remember there's a nerve at the apex of that extracted tooth. So you don't want to damage the nerve with a curette or a big spoon. But you do want to go back behind the second molar with those rongiers and remove the follic remaining follicular sac. Then I'm going to irrigate that out real well. And then I'm packing this with resorbable gauze and socket paste. And this, click on the description of how to never get a dry socket, a YouTube video I made. And if you do this, you'll never get a dry socket. I haven't had a dry socket in 40 years because I pack the sockets of mandibular teeth, especially wisdom teeth, at the time of extraction. If you don't do that, remember a dry socket is losing all or part of the clot in the socket. And so what this resorbable gauze and socket paste do, they create a matrix for that blood clot so it stays in the socket and you don't lose it. It's only got to stay in the socket for seven days because it takes seven days for the connective tissue lining to form in the socket. So the objective is to keep the blood clot in there, in that socket for seven days. And that's what this does. Then I'm going to place two 3 gut suture in the mandibular extraction uh, sites. There's a second one. So one here and one here to suture that tight. And that helps hold the clot and the resorbable gauze in the socket. I only use one suture on the maxilla. And you'll notice with the maxillary wisdom teeth, you don't have to pack those sockets because for some reason, you never, you don't ever use, lose those blood clots, and you don't get a dry socket there. Gravity is working uh, against you on the bottom because you can get food debris in the lower sockets, lower extraction sites. So here's the upper wisdom tooth, the upper right. You make one vertical incision from the distal buckle of the second molar apically to the into the non-attached, non-keratinized gingiva, and then you make another incision across the distal of the second molar. So you can reflect this flap, and many times I'll reflect from here if you have a pretty impacted wisdom tooth. So it gives you more access to the wisdom teeth. Remember, remember the bone is softer in the maxilla, so these are normally easier to extract. You can place a periosteal elevator or, or another elevator in the space between the second molar and the wisdom tooth and just lift it out of there. Be sure you protect the airway with a two by two or the back of a mirror. So this tooth was pretty impacted. So I'm gonna reflect that tissue from the mesial of the second molar back and placing this periosteal elevator and then the 301 elevator. And now th this is another elevator in the socket. And this tooth was not coming completely out, so I'm using the 703 long shank surgical burr to drill a hole in the mesial facial of that wisdom tooth, and I'm gonna elevate it. See the hole right here, Then I'm gonna place that elevator in the hole, the E8, and just lift it out of there. In this case, it's coming out in pieces. I'm drilling a little, another hole in the remaining part and it just elevates right out of there. Upper wisdom teeth that have fully formed roots, any wisdom tooth with a fully formed root is more difficult to remove than a wisdom tooth with just a quarter formed root. So you'd really like to get to them before the root is this formed, especially on the maxillary wisdom teeth because those roots tend to fan out 
and it's a larger extraction site when the tooth is removed. So I'm removing that follicular sac and then again placing one 3 suture in the maxillary extraction to close the flap. Now, this is the lower left impacted wisdom tooth. So my cut through the tooth is going to be from the furca through to the, I mean, from the occlus occlusal surface to the furca in the direction of the long axis of the tooth, this way. Then I'm going to create a space on the distal of the tooth. Now you can either remove bone on the distal or you can remove tooth. And I try to remove more tooth than bone because you're removing the tooth anyway. And then you've created a space to elevate that piece into. If you don't do that, in a case like this where the tooth is completely impacted, it's going to be hard to remove this piece because you've got to remove it straight out since you don't have a space to elevate it into. Here's my facial incision, and this incision comes to the distal lingual of that second molar and then an incision across the distal of the second molar, and I'm going to remove that piece. This periosteal elevator and then Ron Gears, and just remove that piece. Now I'm making a cut on the facial and the distal. Now be sure you don't extend it too far distally because you want to protect that lingual nerve. I mean, be sure you don't extend it too far lingually because you want to protect that lingual nerve. You can see how I'm cutting primarily into the tooth. So see, I'm cutting through the tooth, facial to lingual, from the occlusal to the furcation. And cutting on the facial, then irrigating, I mean, then elevating that distal part You can see the coronal part came out and now we've got the roots remaining so you've got to cut a little further through the furca and you want to be sure you you looked at a radiograph ahead of time to see how far the furcation is from the inferior alveolar nerve. That's why you, another reason you like to have about a quarter of the root formed because you've got some space between the furcation and the inferior alveolar nerve. I'm creating a little more space on the distal. And the facial. And then I've cut all the way through the furcation. And then I'm removing that distal piece. That's why I'm saying you don't want to learn everything you know about extracting impacted wisdom teeth from my videos. You want some hands-on training with someone who does a lot of surgery standing right with you to guide you through many surgeries before you take this on yourself. So here's the distal part. Be sure to protect the airway with a two by two or mirror. And then that was the mesial part. So you take out the distal part and then elevate the mesial part. And then once you've done that, irrigate the socket, remove the follicular membrane, and now I'm going to suture this with two 3 gut suture. Here's the upper wisdom tooth. Same things we did on the right side, a vertical incision down to the non-attached or non-keratinized gingiva, and then an incision around the distal of the second molar. So I'm slipping either the periosteal elevator first between the wisdom, impacted wisdom tooth and the distal of the second molar and elevating first with the peri periosteal elevator and then coming back with this 301 elevator. Once it lifts, you can see I've got the two by two in the back of the mouth to protect the airway. All right, then I remove the follicular sac with my Ron Gears and I'm gonna place one 30 gut suture. And now I'm giving the patient an injection of Marcane which is a long-lasting local anesthetic, and I'll give this at the end, and that will uh, keep the lower jaw, lower uh, the mandible numb for about 12 hours. Then bite down on two folded two by twos. We're done. Then the patient returns in a week. Now you don't want to irrigate the sockets for a week because remember it takes seven days for the connective tissue lining to form in the socket. 
So the patient comes back on the seventh or eighth day and you show them how to irrigate the sockets. And normally you'll have just a small hole back here, distal to the second molar. This is a SKU-10 monojack syringe filled with half warm water and half mouthwash. And they don't squirt it into the extraction site with force. They just fill the extraction site up and let anything, any debris in there float to the top. And they do this at night before they go to bed and they continue to irrigate for a week or two until there's no hole back here to put the tip of the syringe into. That's the Dental Minute. These techniques work and they work every time.